let's get started. Allons-y. Uh, so this is going to follow a sequence, uh, and it follows a sequence of uh, an overview of the, of the match outcomes, uh, so the, much of which was shared early in the data snapshot that was released a couple of weeks ago. Then we'll look at the program perspective, so these are the folks who are in the, on the receiving end of all the applications, and then of course are uh, the, the folks who make the selections. Then we'll focus on the results for our IMG applicant cohort. Then we're going to look at, do a deeper dive on the supply demand uh, uh, aspects of the Canadian medical graduate uh, view, both supply as defined by quote available, by discipline, by region and so on, and then by demand, which uh, demand for us uh, is defined by the first choice discipline interest of Canadian medical graduates. Uh, so that's how that, uh, that kind of ratio uh, and other kinds of uh, views and lenses of supply and demand is, uh, is looked at. It's a bit of a, an economic view of things. Uh, scarcity and, uh, and where there are constraints, and then we'll look at the results from a Canadian medical graduate perspective, and then we'll focus on uh, the important conversation around unmatched and unfilled positions uh, in Canada. So some themes, and these are just, uh, you know, it, this will be a long list of themes if we uh, touched on everything, but these are some of the things that kind of emerged uh, as we looked at it, and I'm, I'm sure others in the audience will, will focus in on other things uh, beyond these, but these are just some of the things that uh, I, I suspect you'll, uh, you'll see uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, so quick uh, match overview, and uh, we're going to look now at the national high-level results. And again, much of this data was released in the data snapshot, but for those who haven't looked at that, uh, we'll take a walk through and just make sure we orient ourselves around uh, the different aspects of the match and how things work and uh, what some of the meaning behind the data is. So you know, we have three primary groups of applicants uh, uh, that, are, that we, we look at, and this is by and large a function of where people have graduated medical school. It has nothing to do with citizenship, place of birth, or anything else. It's all to do with your, your medical school uh, uh, alignment. So CMGs, uh, US medical graduates, uh, which are the allopathic uh, graduates, uh, and IMGs, international medical graduates, and a registrant is somebody who simply signs into CARMS online, gets issued what's called a token, uh, and then they are registered to be, to be able to participate in the match. Uh, from that group, which is in total 5,565, if you haven't done the quick math, uh, and then there are people who don't go any further than that, uh, or they might, they might apply to a program but then withdraw. So that's, uh, that's the second group. Active applicants are those who apply to at least one program. That's that cohort. And then if you apply to a program but don't submit a rank order list, uh, then you're in that, uh, in that category, uh, the next uh, part, not quite the part of this column from the right. And you can see you know, that oftentimes is because people don't receive an interview, or interview invitation. So you'll see the fairly high number of IMGs. Uh, that, that's not always the case, but that is one of, the, uh, one of the primary factors there. And then final participants are those who submit a rank order list with, the, with at least one program on it. So we had 5,318 active applicants and 4,779 final participants, those who actually submitted a rank order list. This is a lot of data on one slide, so I'll unpack it for you. Uh, first iteration. So first iteration uh, eligibility criteria uh, is you must not have previous postgraduate training. That's the essential criteria for first iteration participation. Within first iteration, uh, there are, uh, other than Quebec, there are two streams. There's a CMG stream and an IMG stream. In Quebec, it's competitive. So all IMGs who are considered to be eligible to participate all compete with uh, CMGs with those Quebec positions. So in first iteration, it's kind of a two-stream or three-stream approach if you include uh, Quebec as a third stream. Uh, so current year, and current year for CMGs at least, is defined as those who are on class lists from uh, an Ontario medical school. So that's what's considered a current year. A prior year are people who have not been matched and not have prior grad, post-grad training, but who have not previous, but who have previously participated. So that's the breakdown of that, of that group. So you can see the match percentages there, and I won't go through them in, through them in detail. And then the, 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 the pie chart on the right-hand side, that's the position view, so the quota. So we're 3,308 positions in total available uh, in the first iteration, of which 3,080 were filled uh, in that first iteration, leaving 228 uh, to then go into the second iteration. So second iteration, uh, everybody who 
participate in first iteration, who chooses to participate in second iteration is in that, as well as those who had prior postgrad training. So that's the, that's the uh, group there. And there, uh, in everywhere but Quebec, because in Quebec it's already blended and already competitive, uh, then those, all those CMG and IMG positions become competitive uh, in the second iteration for both unmatched participants from first and those with prior postgrad training. So the prior year folks, uh, and there's often questions about you know, how many transfers were there, so we don't really define them, define people as transfers because really, we really don't know their circumstances as to why they're, why they're coming back into the match cycle. Uh, they could be for a lot of reasons. Folks may have had prior post-grad training 10 years ago, left the program for whatever personal reasons and then are want to re-enter. Or they could be people that are currently in a residency position and in fact, are looking to move from that position to someplace else. So we have called that out under the prior year uh, category to the, far, to the right hand side, the, 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 the table underneath, where it says matched with prior postgrad training, 13 of CMGs and 11 matched uh, with, uh, with prior, uh, that, that have prior postgrad training uh, uh, that, are, that are not, so I helped it. So that prior year matched 11 and 13 with prior postgrad training and then, 54 unmatched, of which 30 of those uh, also had prior postgrad training. So we had a total of 40, 43 uh, who were participated with prior postgrad training, 13 of which matched. So that's the picture there. So then you'll see from a quota perspective uh, of the 228 that were unfilled in first iteration, 150 filled, 78 unfilled. So I mentioned the, uh, the, the, the definition of current year grad uh, is, is as defined by the class list received from the medical, medical schools. There are people uh, who have uh, been on that current year list more than, two, more, in more than one year. So people who participated in a match and then did not match and then went back to, in some cases, the fifth year or fourth year, uh, then they will then see, be seen again on a subsequent class list. And this is, these are the numbers for the last uh, five years. So in, in 2018, there were 44 people who were on the current year class list uh, who had previously participated but had not been matched. This is a view of that, uh, that, that earlier table uh, broken down by region. And you'll see that uh, there's a fairly, uh, fairly a small variation from region to region across the country. Uh, Eastern uh, has a slightly larger percentage than the national. Uh, Quebec slightly lower, but uh, uh, Quebec and Ontario in around 92 and a half. Uh, so uh, not a huge variation from, from region to region. And then uh, the number of unmatched is a smaller n in each one of the regions, so those percentages tend to vary a little bit, uh, vary a little bit more. So not a not a massive uh, a shift from region to region, really. And this is the view from a uh, from a fill rate perspective uh, for the quota, and you can see the uh, that in the first iteration, uh, the largest number of un, uh, unfilled are in Quebec. Uh, and that's a fairly, uh, a fairly uh, common theme throughout. And the one thing that is consistent year from this year to last year is that the large proportion of those unfilled positions in Quebec are family medicine. Uh, this year of the 69 unfilled in Quebec, 65 of them are in family medicine, which has uh, driven down their, their fill rate. And Eastern region, 100% uh, fill rate and uh, certainly Western and Ontario, pretty, pretty close to that with small numbers of, of unfilled. This is a view of, the, uh, of, of who entered into postgrad or who will be entering into postgrad training on July 1st. Uh, so just to orient you, the, uh, the small burgundy uh, uh, section on the far left-hand side are the prior year CMGs matched. The large blue section are current year CMGs matched. The green are the IMGs. And the small uh, yellow portion on the far right-hand side are, are USMGs. So, uh, just a couple things to call out here that this is the first time since 2011 that there have been fewer than 400 uh, uh, IMGs uh, who uh, enter into postgrad training on July 1st. Uh, there were 3,230 total matched applicants. Uh, applicants. Uh, prior year CMGs, 57% matched. Current year CMGs, 96% matched. IMGs, 22.6. And USMGs, uh, just a little more than 58. And that's combined first and second iteration. So pretty, pretty similar numbers for the last five years in total number of positions filled uh, in, uh, in Canada. 
So now we'll turn this to the program perspective, and this is really, you know, this is all kind of the inbound uh, uh, activity, uh, looking for people, people looking to, uh, to apply. So that's uh, looking through that lens. And here, uh, this is, a, I think, a familiar slide to most folks uh, who've been attending these and view this uh, data for the last uh, few years. And this shows the average number of applications per Canadian medical graduates and international medical graduates uh, over the course of the last uh, 10 years. And this is the first time uh, where the lines cross each other. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, in BC, uh, there was a cap placed on the number of IMGs who can participate in the match. BC has a higher than average number of applications per applicant, uh, plus uh, it had a high number of IMGs actually applying to BC previously, so that combination really drove down the national average as well. Uh, in Newfoundland, uh, there was no IMG quota. Uh, at all in, in, the, in the first or second iteration. And again, Newfoundland had a relatively high uh, participation rate, so the com combination of those two drove it down. But the other feature here is that, uh, is that the CMG number continues to go up. And it was, uh, it was under 20 last year, so now we're pushing hard on 21. Uh, and uh, there is, you know, there's lots of talk at the conference about, about wellness. Uh, and uh, you know, underlying that trend uh, is are some issues I think that do affect wellness that I've heard people talk about you know the, the uncertainty factor uh, if I submit one more application uh, I'm going to increase my chances uh, the the likelihood of being unmatched or or, or missing out on something is uh, is a great concern so that thinking uh, is uh, you know is some of that at least is under underway here with that uh, with that line uh, and as Janice mentioned, uh, and as I mentioned earlier on the stakeholder consultation, it's the, this is the kind of thing that uh, I th think we'll probably end up talking about. Uh, from a system perspective, there's a lot of concern that, that this, is, this level of activity and this level of sort of you know, application uh, behavior, if I can use that word, uh, is you know, for getting close to the same outcomes in many respects uh, is something we want to consider. Is there a better way? Uh, and certainly the unmatched is not a desirable outcome in any way, uh, and it's undesirable and, uh, uh, and unintended, uh, but is, if this is the answer, uh, then it's, uh, it's also driving some other things that are, that are not necessarily uh, intended or desirable. This is uh, a view uh, of, the, of, the, of the kind of clusters of number of ranks, uh, and uh, this is in relation to the previous graph, so not unexpectedly, <clears throat> the, the, the numbers are, are, are shifting to the right. Uh, so the number of people who had less than five applications uh, between 2015 and 2018 is down 60%. The number of people who, uh, this is, these are CMGs now, number of CMGs who had six to 10 applications down 27% in the last, uh, in the last four years. The number from 11 to 20 is up eight, uh, from 21 to 30 is up 30%. And the number who are, who are submitting between 31 and 40 up 46%. And the number that are going from you know, to over, over 40 applications is up 90% from 2015 to 2018. So this massive shift to the right, uh, of course, is uh, very much related to the earlier slide. Uh, this is a view, uh, the quota, if you will, the perspective of, uh, of some four, and, and this is, you'll, you'll see this as a common theme throughout the presentation, this grouping of, uh, of, of disciplines just for presentation purposes. Of course, under each one of these clusters, other than family medicine and internal medicine, there are multiple disciplines. Uh, so you'll see that the family medicine number, although the numbers aren't hugely increasing, they have increased. So family medicine positions from 2013 to 2018 have gone up 103 across the country. Uh, internal medicine up 21, not surprisingly, with the focus on primary care uh, at, a, at a provincial uh, provincial policy level, so those aren't surprising. Uh, but the, the corollary to that is the surgical the discipline uh, quota has decreased by 47, and the non-surgical has decreased by 25. So uh, I don't think it's terribly surprising, but sometimes the data is, uh, is revealing in terms of the, the, the relative uh, proportion of, of shifting across the uh, across the discipline, so this is a national view. And this is a view now of uh, quota in relation to the number of applicants uh, and the number of applications. So the green is the quota over the last five, six years. 
The blue are the distinct number of applicants, uh, and the burgundy are the number of applications. So applications are up 66% in the last, for the, over the last six years. And certainly in my conversations with postgrad uh, deans uh, and uh, program directors, that has not come with a, a coincidental increase in resources to manage that, that, that process, manage that volume of work, manage the assessment, the decision making, the reviewing of files. Uh, so you know, what is, uh, you know, at the end of the uh, application period, so November 23rd, uh, I think it was this year, uh, that file review time between then and, and uh, when the interview invitations have to go out for interviews, that has uh, become a very, very condensed period of time uh, with a lot of people having to do a lot of work. Uh, so this just gives you a bit, a bit of context. So again, from a wellness perspective, uh, there is some consideration here around is there something in the system that we can do differently to, do, to get as good or better outcomes uh, with maybe a different approach to it that uh, doesn't, doesn't kind of take this, this, some of these unintended, uh, uh, unintended activities. This now is, a, a, is a, a slice of that, so this is for family medicine. And uh, you can see here, uh, if you were to do the math, which, uh, which we've done, that in 2015, uh, less than 13, uh, uh, less than 13 uh, per applicant uh, and 20, 20 applications per position. Uh, 2016, we had the peak number of applicants. Uh, so the number of applicants to family medicine went down between 2016 and 2018. However, the applications continued to go up. Uh, so for the same, for a fewer number of people, there are more, there are more files to review and uh, you know, some, many programs, many faculties have taken on an approach to do a bit of a consolidated uh, review of files and they take some efficient approaches that way, but nonetheless, uh, that information and that uh, you know, documentation flows uh, into, uh, and it always ultimately has to be assessed. And this is the view from an internal medicine perspective and uh, in 2017, uh, that you might recall from last year, we had uh, a tip of internal medicine to go from what, what was a uh, more supply than demand, and again, supply is measured by number of quota, demand by first choice discipline. In 2017, there was more demand than supply. So it went uh, kind of flipped in 2017. Now, it's, now it flipped back again this year. Uh, however, uh, in 2018, uh, you know, number of applicants or lower than 2016, but more applications. So the same idea as family medicine. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the ratios are, uh, are, are really becoming quite, uh, quite dramatic. Now we're gonna shift into uh, reviewing the, uh, the results for our IMG applicant uh, cohort. This, uh, for those of you who have been around to, uh, for a few years, is a familiar slide. It just shows the, the relative participation of new IMG registrants with uh, returning IMG res registrants. In uh, 2015, uh, well, in 2014, the, in the introduction of mandatory NAC-OSCE took place, which drove down uh, for that uh, one year uh, the number of registrants uh, for, the, uh, for the new, uh, for the new, new, new registrants. And then it's been pretty steady since then. In fact, a bit of an uptick uh, in uh, 2017 and flat in 2018. This is uh, a view of uh, three uh, groupings of IMG applicants and participants uh, for the, in three categories. One being the, their, with their first attempt at the match, so that's the blue. And uh, those that have uh, participated for two to three times, and that's the, uh, that's the burgundy. And then green are those who have participated for, more, for three or more uh, attempts. And uh, again, you can see, if you look at the numbers, uh, you'll see that quick drop, that very dramatic drop off between 2014 and 2015 in the first attempt. And that, that group kind of works its way down uh, the, the, the years uh, to where we are today. So that being a bit of a, uh, inflection point in 2015 where there was a, a big jump and some shifting around pretty much steadied out, uh, flattened out in the last three years where for uh, people in their first attempt are in around 25, 23 uh, percent in there for a second or third attempt it's uh, just uh, just around 15 percent and, and for those who are participating for three or more times uh, it's uh, 10 or just a little bit below 10. This is a view of the uh, match results, so the percent match uh, based on uh, different uh, 
uh, parts of the world and where they've graduated uh, medical school from, gives you final participation numbers, and some you know, quite varying percentages of, uh, of match, uh, match success rate, high of 41 uh, in Europe. I can tell you that Europe, uh, by and large, is the UK. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's predominantly in, uh, in Ireland and uh, in, in Great Britain. And then the other relatively large number is in, uh, you know, lar larger even in Europe, is uh, what's called Oceania and, and Pacific Island. That's Austra Australia. Uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, that's Australia, 53%. So pretty high rate, uh, certainly higher than most other, uh, uh, all the other, uh, all the other uh, uh, places in the world. So now we'll uh, focus ourselves on uh, Canadian medical graduates, supply and demand, and this is where we're going to do a deep dive on, on uh, how many of how, what disciplines are there in relation to uh, the, the, the interest uh, of the Canadian medical graduate uh, uh, cohort. And again, uh, supply, available quota, demand, first choice interest, uh, either by discipline or in, uh, or in clusters. So this is uh, a view of the, of the full system, and uh, the, the green uh, is IMG quota, the very top of the bar. The blue is CMG quota, so the large, uh, the large bar. The yellow is CMG participation rates, so these are the uh, you know, current or prior year uh, participants, current or prior year uh, 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 in the first, this is now first and second iteration. Uh, first and sec first iteration, sorry, participation on quota, second iteration unmatched, and then the the, uh, the dark burgundy line is IMG participation. The dotted line are the unmatched current year CMGs, and that's numbers. So this year it's 69, and we define unmatched current year CMGs after second iteration as those who participated in second iteration, and that's a common and consistent definition of what's considered an unmatched. CMG, it's after second iteration participation. Because if you don't participate in second iteration, we're not sure what your, what your status is, so we don't want to make assumptions on, uh, on, on things, but further data on some of, the, uh, some of those who didn't match first iteration and didn't participate in the second, uh, just in a, in a few slides down. This is uh, uh, some of that same information, but then we add the element of the ratio. Uh, ratio is a, a very common conversation uh, and a common number that is, uh, is discussed and debated. Uh, so the, the, the number you'll see uh, at the last since uh, 2014, a number below 1.05 nationally. Uh, the blue is the participation of current year CMGs. The green is participation of prior year CMGs. And the uh, quota is the, the dash above each one of the columns and then the ratio is the circle above. Uh, so uh, the positions have declined uh, in the aggregate by 19 since 2015. Uh, the combination of current and prior year participation is up by 61. So that's, the, that's kind of the shifting in, in time. The, the, the numbers in the, in the circles there are a little bit, uh, a little bit might, might, be, uh, might be not as accurate, not, they are accurate, but there's rounding there, so uh, it, it, it appears like there's more of a difference than there really is. So in 2016, that number was 1.024. In 2017, it was 1.026. So what looks like one, a real you know, one percentage increase is not. It's, uh, it's a very, very tiny, uh, tiny change, and then 1.01 is just a smidgen under, uh, under the rounding number. So here's some uh, views of the, of the CMG discipline choices over time. Again, in those four familiar uh, categories of family medicine, internal medicine, surgical disciplines, and non-surgical disciplines. Uh, a, a general uh, decline, at least for fam so family medicine, for many, many, many years, increased in its, uh, in its first choice discipline entrance for CMGs. That peaked uh, at 39%. Uh, at in 2015, and then since then, uh, it's come down to where it's now 33%. Internal medicine uh, during that same period of time went from 14 to 16. Uh, surgical disciplines uh, declined for many years. Uh, in 2002, it was at 21%. Uh, and it went back up uh, for some time uh, and, uh, it w and went decline, sorry, until 2015 when it was at a low of 13. Now it's uh, gone back up again to 15%. And the non-surgical disciplines were 35% of the total uh, in 2011 and now they're 37%. So family medicine 
coming down, the other categories going up. This is a view of the top 10 uh, discipline choices for CMGs uh, for the last three years. And again, you'll see as, uh, as reflected in the previous slide, down two and a half percent just in the last two years. 2015, as I mentioned earlier, was 39%. So you'll get a sense of that, uh, that relative shift amongst the, uh, amongst the various disciplines uh, that are the top 10 for Canadian uh, medical graduates. So this is a view of the percentage of, uh, of Canadian medical graduate choices that are in disciplines that are either supply more than demand or demand more than supply. So for example, in 2015, the far right-hand pie, 31% of all CMGs chose a discipline that had more demand than supply. And 68, not quite 69%, chose discipline that had more supply than demand, and a very small number chose that happened to be a discipline that had a one-to-one -one relationship, uh, one-to-one -one ratio. Contrast that with 2018, where now it's 39% of CMGs choose a discipline that has more demand than supply. So that number has come up 8%. So not only do we have an issue where the ratio uh, nationally is tighter, we also have a, a phenomenon where there is a shift towards the more high demand disciplines, uh, generally speaking. Uh, now, there's some, some of the math is you have less, you know, a tighter ratio, there, there's going to be generally more demand and supply than there had been previously, but that's, this goes beyond that particular phenomenon. So this is a view, again, those four, same four categories uh, of what things like, look like across the country. Uh, the blue is Western Canada, the green is Ontario, the orange is Quebec, uh, and the burgundy is Eastern, uh, Eastern Canada, which is Dallin Memorial. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the red dash is the, is the national average uh, of, uh, of the ratio. So this is by discipline cluster, so family medicine, you know, quite a fair variation uh, across the country. Internal medicine, again, a fair variation. Uh, both, both family medicine and internal medicine this year are more supply than demand uh, in, their, uh, in their disciplines, and then surgical and non-surgical. Again, lots of variation across the country, uh, but both those, uh, both those groupings have more demand than supply. So here's a view, similar kind of view, but for family medicine focus. And so you'll see, and I'll again orient you, so the national is the columns, the, the blue columns. Uh, Quebec is the, uh, the orange line. Uh, Western is the kind of gray line there that's uh, in around 1, 1.1. 1 .1. uh, Ontario is green, and uh, Eastern is, uh, is the burgundy there. So the, just a couple things to probably to point out here is that Western Canada was really the only region uh, where the change in availability of quota was met with a proportionate uh, change in, uh, in demand from, from the applicant perspective. So you can see that that is a pretty flat curve uh, from, uh, from 2013 to 2018 uh, in around 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, whereas Atlantic, Canada, and Quebec, uh, you know, supply, uh, you know, more quota, uh, far outpaced the demand change over that same period of time. In Ontario, uh, demand change did outpace supply until about 2015 uh, when the demand dropped off relative to supply and until uh, this year when, again, there was a slight shift. Uh, so the combination of all those patterns are what you see uh, with the, uh, the blue lines nationally. So here's a picture of the, uh, of, of the lowest demand in, uh, in relation to supply uh, disciplines across the country. Uh, we'll see there the, the, the ratio. So for example, the far right-hand side, the green bar 2016 for hematological pathology, five. So there were five positions available for every one CMG interested in that discipline. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, big, uh, pretty big shift. And then the fill rate is within the, within the, uh, the column. Uh, these are not, this, these uh, d disciplines have pretty much remained constant years over years, a few, some changes year to year, but uh, you know, oftentimes the same, uh, the same groups. And then the same can be seen for the flip of this, uh, which is these are the high demand disciplines. And uh, fill rates, again, are in the column, so 100% of these positions fill every year. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, given the uh, demand supply ratio uh, for those disciplines. And, uh, 
there's, uh, in some cases, you know, very you know, extreme. So in plastic surgery this year, there were, there were three times as many people wanting that discipline as their first choice than there were positions available. And uh, if there are uh, people who only choose plastic surgery as their, as their discipline of, of interest, uh, even if they apply across the country, and if that's the case for every, everybody who does that, then two-thirds of them won't match. So that's, just, that's just the math. Uh, now, as, as, we said, as we said earlier, there's a shift to applying to more disciplines and more, and more, uh, and more ranks, so that is not the case. Uh, you don't have that, that happening, but that would be the math if that, uh, if that in fact, were the, uh, were the situation. So I'm going to pause there for a second. Uh, there was a lot of stuff there. Uh, and uh, if any, there are mics there and there. So anybody have any questions about the material to this point? I see somebody getting up. I'm not going to the mic. I'm going to the mic. Yes, going to the mic. Yeah. Hi, Fraser. Just a quick question about the number of programs applied to, and I wondered whether that included any of the couples match uh, data and trends that we might be seeing in that in terms of either numbers of couples going in or numbers of programs applied to. So, uh, so that, the, those numbers do include couples, uh, for sure. The, 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 uh, the, the number of couples uh, participating this year was 111. Uh, it was 109 the year before, pretty consistent, uh, you know, in around, uh, you know, sort of you know, one, or two, one or two up and down, yeah. By the way, uh, because you got up and asked a question, you get a prize. Uh, uh, so we, we have in fact, we have in fact, and I, this is a, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not getting a commission, we don't get a commission, but there's a book here called Who Gets What and Why. Some of you, some, some of you will know about this book because I've been kind of around talking to people and this is written by a guy by the name of Alvin Roth. Uh, that's a name might be familiar, he's a, one of the uh, folks who wrote the algorithm, the Roth Branson algorithm which uh, was a derivative of the Gale Shapley algorithm. And the reason why this one's, uh, why the Roth Branson uh, algorithm is, is important is because it's the one that introduced couples uh, before the algorithm did not handle couples at all well. Uh, so now it does. So we're gonna, everybody who asks a question gets a book. So Fraser. <laughs> Thank you. Whether that encourages more questions, I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, any other questions? I hard time seeing, yeah. Sorry. Student from McMaster. Um, thank you for going through this. Um, if I understand correctly, the unmatched statistics that you presented only include students who did participate in the second iteration, and I believe it's about an 80% discrepancy there. Or sorry, so 80% of students who don't match in the first iteration join the second iteration. So, so, it's six, so the 69, what, what are called yes. unmatched after second iteration, are those who participate in second iteration. There's another 46. Okay. who did not participate in second iteration unmatched from first. We're going to explore those numbers uh, and when we get into the category of unmatched and unfilled, but you're, but you're right, there is that second, that second group, yeah. Okay, maybe I'll hold my question until you present more then. What's that? I think I, you might address my question in your future slides. Okay, we'll hold your book for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, Kaif Pradhan. I'm an emergency physician. I work in Toronto and Hamilton. Uh, thanks for a great talk. It's always very interesting to see these slides. Um, I was uh, stunned by the number of applications and how much that's increased. So I matched about eight years ago. Um, and so the, the numbers have really skewed since then mm -hmm. to the right. Um, and I'm wondering, just to help contextualize it for the room, if you know offhand what the average amount of money that applicants paid to CARMS this past year. Um, and I'm also wondering if, if you have the uh, data based on the post-CARMS survey that you send out, uh, the average number of interviews applicants got, because that'll also help us contextualize what the financial burden is on our trainees as, as these numbers skew so far to the right. Sure, sure, Thanks. great question. Thanks for that. Uh, I don't have a precise number of, of, the, of the fees that they pay to CARMS, but I think the number is in around 650 uh, is the number. But I, I can just tell you, and, I, and it's not because I want to kind of uh, distract you from that particular fact, but you know, the, the, the cost of flying to places and all those other things, uh, you know, from, from what we hear from the CARMS post-match survey, 
and other you know, anecdotal and, uh, and conversations we have, it's the, that's the bigger number in total, but, uh, but you're right, uh, which is again why we, why we changed the fee structure, so we included more, more in the base fee because of that phenomenon was going up, so we're trying to kind of mitigate that in some way, but it is, but it is for sure an issue. The number of people who get interviews, not something we know. We, some of that information does is asked in the post-match survey, but it's not something we don't think is reliable enough to actually report. Uh, some of you, and, uh, and now all of you will know, is that we are pursuing uh, uh, the, uh, something called an interview communication system, uh, which is uh, per, uh, hopefully will be posted on the CARMS, uh, the CARMS portal uh, and the CARMS platform. Uh, and we have a working group underway right now to uh, get, the, get the specifics and functionality around all that. So in coming years, uh, all of the interviews will be offered and responded to uh, via the CARMS platform. And from that will come some data. Uh, which, uh, which again, we'll, we'll get some agreement around what the data will be, but uh, that at least will be a, a source of some data around all that. Hi. Hi, um, I'm Malin. And, 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 by, and by the way, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, no but, but this is just a kind of a, 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 way, a way point of the presentation. There's more to come and there'll be more opportunities to ask questions, but just so you don't think you have to rush the mic uh, before, uh, before they are. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm a medical student from McMaster. My question also stems from a concern about the increasing number of applications students are submitting. Has there ever been any analysis done on the association between the number of applications a student submits and their match outcome? There, there have, uh, there has, uh, and, and, it's, um, and there has been some presentation of that data. The, the, the issue is, though, that you will find the same application patterns in both a matched and an unmatched applicant. You know, so it's not like you can draw, even a correlation is hard to find, let alone cause and effect. So, so we have done some of that, uh, but it's not something where we can say, well, see, you know, when that happens, then that happens, and so don't stop, so stop doing that. Uh, we haven't seen that kind of thing. Okay, and with regards to the granularity of that data, is it divided by discipline? Yes. Yes, we have, and we can, and we, if you have a particular question on that, you know, you can, on our website, you can go in there and, uh, and make a data request, and uh, we're happy to provide that kind of data. So we, we, we do do some deep dives into some of that from time to time, and uh, I think that's a great, you know, what you're flagging here is maybe some more pursuit of that in coming, uh, in coming forms. Yeah, awesome. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, John, thank you for that presentation. Uh, Henry Ann, and President of Canadian Federation of Medical Students. Um, in terms of the categories that you use, you know, you talked about like previous year on match, and that also includes uh, folks that are participating in the second iteration. Mm -hmm. uh, and even for the current year unmatched, that may include students that are enrolled in a fifth year program. Um, and that depends on how the, the schools define the, the applicants, I believe, right. from my yeah. understanding. Yeah, on, so, on, on, on their class list, basically. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. So yep. Um, just because there's been a lot of attention on the unmatched crisis, and we just want to make sure that the, the messaging that we're putting out is, is quite consistent and clear to folks that perhaps aren't um, as involved in medical education. Yeah. Uh, how can faculty, how can we help streamline the information so that we know, for example, how many actual previous year unmatched, current years, and, and those kinds of, because that's really helpful for us. Sure, Henry, that's a, it's a great question. And uh, as, you know, as, as different issues emerge, of course, different data becomes more, more important and more important to get more granular about, and that's, that's exactly what's going on here. So, so the, 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 you know, getting clear on what constitutes a current year Canadian medical graduate uh, or what constitutes uh, somebody who can participate in prior year and uh, using the sort of shorthand terminology of transfers and so on it just doesn't cut it uh, because it's, uh, it doesn't help uh, from a decision-making point of view or even from an understanding point of view. So we're going to be uh, getting a group of folks together to help us uh, get crystal clear on data definitions as well as what additional data would be helpful uh, as we're trying to understand this and other issues. So uh, you can look forward to that and some of our leaders uh, at, at, at the AFMC committees and learners, uh, we're gonna pull together and get some, again, to your point, it's important that we all have a shared uh, and accurate understanding of what in fact the data needs, uh, data means. Yeah, thanks Henry. Okay, okay, we'll, uh, we will move on. What have I done with the clicker? Probably in my pocket, there we go. Okay. 
So now we're going to move on to the uh, CMG results, and by results we mean outcomes, uh, you know, exactly what happened. So all, a lot of this that we've just been talking about are, are, are the inputs. So supply, demand, how, many, how much quota, how many people, how many positions. Uh, that's, those are the inputs, and it's the inputs that in many ways define the outputs, the inputs and the decisions that define the outcomes. So, uh, and so now we're going to move on to the CMG view. This is a view of the uh, mobility of Canadian medical graduates uh, over the years. And uh, the blue are those who match to their school of medical uh, graduation. Green are those who stay in the province, uh, in, but, but, are, but are, again, stay in the province of their, of their graduating medical school. And the burgundy are those who move out of province. And this is, you know, for, this is important for a number of reasons. Number one, it really illustrates the national nature of the match really drives home that point that choice, not only in discipline, but choice in location matters to people, and, uh, and it's reflected in, in their choices. Uh, it also says that provincial decisions have an impact nationally. So with all of the things that are happening with uh, uh, you know, different, different approaches to, uh, to solutions, I think it's important for all of us to keep in mind that a national system is uh, in many ways uh, the foundation of, uh, of, of how the system works. So just something for us, to, uh, for us to keep in mind. This is a frequency distribution of where people match on their rank order list. Uh, so 1,495 people this year, CMG applicants. This is, the, this is individuals, does not include couples. So individuals. Uh, 1,495 ranked to their first, their first, uh, first choice. Another 359 to their second, 211 to their third, 115 to their fourth, and 89 to their fifth. The grand total of the people who rank match in their top five is 90%. That's a consistent number for the last few years. It was 93 in 2014, so it has slipped just a little bit in the last little while, but still 50 still 90% in the top five rank. Now just a, a, a pause around, uh, around how the system works and just kind of things that, things that are important for us to, to, to remember. So after the whole you know, information sharing process, interviews, uh, you know, people have to make decisions. And this is where people get to make safe decisions. Their, you, an applicant's preference is not known to anybody. They are safe to indicate their true preferences and in fact, their true preferences is, is what's needed in order for this system to work. Because if people don't feel safe to make their true preferences known through the rank order list, then it starts to unravel. And uh, just a, a little, you know, a little color commentary, this is my personal opinion, uh, that you know, things that start to happen different province, differently province to province can create, uh, I think, an unintended effect of making some of those choices appear to be less safe. If folks are wondering if there's something else going to happen that I don't know about, uh, then they may start to think differently about what their choices are. So not necessarily that's the case, but you know, I have heard even anecdotally in the last little while that people say, well, gee, I wonder if. Uh, so when that happens, then the decision-making process starts to become impacted, and this becomes less of a safe process. So just something to keep in mind for those of us that are in those, uh, in those decision processes. And ultimately, and this is a bit of a technical thing, when people submit their rank order list and the, and the algorithm produces a result, which is intended to optimize uh, all of those choices, it produces what's called a stable result. And a stable result is one in which n the, no pair of matched applicant and program would both want something else. That's the definition of a, of a, of a stable match, just as, a, as an FYI. And those of you who are lucky enough to get a book, you'll find that in there. Uh, <laughs> And it's on Kindle, FYI, and uh, again, I'm not, I'm not getting a commission, so. Uh, so this is the, this is the couples match. Uh, a very similar view in terms of its, of its distribution. Uh, an N of 111, uh, there was one couple who didn't match this year. Uh, many years, it's 100%, but this, couple won, uh, th this year, one couple did not match. Uh, so it's, uh, but it, in, in, in 110 of 111 didn't match. Similar frequency distribution uh, as, in the, as in the individuals. This is the view of the, uh, of the CMG to match their top three program choices. Uh, you'll see, uh, so first, second, and third, that has come down uh, since 2013. 
Uh, and in 2013, 63% of all of the applicants had 10 or fewer ranks. Now that number is 35% had 10 or fewer ranks. 2013, 6% uh, of applicants uh, ranked 21 or more programs. Uh, this year, 30%. So uh, it, uh, you know, a, five, a factor of five increase in the number of people ranking uh, 21 or more uh, programs. This is, uh, a, again, a, a phenomenon, I think, as we're, as we're talking about, that is just sort of you know, the ranking application, all of, those, uh, all of those decisions are being driven by some underlying factors, which I know are the kinds of things we're, uh, we're looking to uh, bring some solutions around. Uh, this is the picture of match to first choice discipline, and uh, we're in and around, we're in uh, just a little under 87%. That peak was in 2011, where it was 92. And uh, so the, 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 the demand and the supply is certainly impacting the, 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 what, what would be called a success rate of matching to your discipline of choice. Now it's at 86.7. Uh, the other view of this is around, uh, around the discipline group. So the, uh, the blue is family medicine, green is internal medicine, orange are the, uh, are the surgical, the non-surgical disciplines, sorry, and the, and the burgundy are the surgical disciplines. And, uh, you know, family medicine, you know, pretty much at a 99% uh, rate for years, uh, those who choose family medicine as a first choice discipline will match. Uh, internal medicine, a slightly uh, lower number. Uh, you'll, in 2017, you'll see the dip, and that was when the tipping point of supply and demand took place, so not, a, not an unexpected uh, situation, but back up again. And then, uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, that, that, that shifting to the high demand disciplines is, in, in, I think is not surprisingly, you'll see that the, uh, that the impact on the, on the reduction in the number of, in the actual match rate uh, to those disciplines for their first choice. It might still match, but not to their, not to their first choice. Uh, now this is a view by region. So a lot of pretty, pretty busy lines crossing each other there. And not surprisingly, since the overall first choice discipline number is going down, uh, you know, by region is down, but you know, Quebec actually jumped up uh, from 2070 to 2018, as did Eastern region, you know, up to 90% first choice discipline success rate. This is a, uh, a view of the uh, people who match their first three program choices by, by discipline group. Uh, internal medicine is the highest, uh, non-surgical discipline at 84. So again, blue is family medicine, same color scheme. Uh, green internal medicine, non-surgical is, uh, is the orange, and surgical is the burgundy. You might, there's a bit of a kind of a paradox there. Uh, you know, with the first choice discipline for family medicine, very, very high. Uh, yet those to match their top three program choices is the lowest of the group. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, haven't really dissected this too much, but uh, interestingly, of all these four groups, uh, the, the numbers who match to their top choice is within 0.5% of each other, but it diverges in, in the second and third choice for whatever reason that is. There's some speculation that the number of training sites for family medicine might have an effect on, 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 that, on that percentage, because in, in many, many faculties there's, there's multiple training sites, so that would give them more choices, more sites that they would have to rank, uh, potentially to uh, be able to uh, uh, pursue a, a, a family medicine position in one of those faculties, so maybe some, uh, some, relation, uh, some relation there. So questions on that? And by the way, uh, we've been talking a little bit about, about uh, well, even some, a lot about the, the, whole, the whole phenomenon of uh, increased number of applications and, and the workload and so on with that. Uh, I'm happy to say that there are some good conversations going on about that. Uh, and as I mentioned, we'll be looking to uh, talk more about that this afternoon, but uh, we've been having some very, uh, very uh, helpful and I think productive conversations with some of our colleagues, particularly in family medicine, uh, who are considering some different options and uh, some which are, you know, you might call it incremental and kind of about, uh, about just making the system work better, but some, some of them about, well, are there some different things about uh, how the work gets done? Uh, so there's lots of good collaborative conversations uh, that are being, uh, that, are, that, are, that we're into, and, uh, and that's very encouraging from my perspective. Question, yes. Hi, my name's Andy, I'm a medical student from U of T. Hi. Um, I had a question about the proportion match their first choice uh, mm -hmm. discipline. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to go back to that slide? Sure. 
Um, by region, sorry. Or oh, by region? Yeah. So just two slides forward. Um, excellent. So I'm sorry. Um, for what, what I see from this is that most of the regions stay relatively stable, mm -hmm. um, but since 2014, 2015-ish, uh, Quebec has had a decline. Now, I've looked a little bit more carefully into this data as well, and when you break it down by Quebec schools, McGill stays stable, uh, whereas Laval, Sherbrooke, and Montreal have the decline, uh, mm -hmm. which is actually more pronounced because here McGill offers a bit of a buffer. I was wondering if you have any insight into why there's been this decline in these last few years um, in terms of people matching to their first choice discipline. It's a great question, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, we can we can take that away from a data perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there may be people in the audience who have who have their own hypotheses about that, uh, and if there are, you know, feel free to feel free to share and uh, or maybe have a conversation uh, uh, offline. Uh, so we'll let's capture that request just to have a bit of an understanding. What if we can unpack a little bit a little bit of that, and uh, maybe we can bring that for uh, for next time. Yeah, thanks for thanks for the question. Yes. Thank you. Actually, it's, uh, that's very simple arithmetic. The government uh, decides the number of positions and basically has increased the number of positions in family medicine uh, and decreased the number of positions in other specialties. And it doesn't take that much to make a fairly big difference and, and also it created a lot of uh, stress in our residents. Thanks, Marla. It's, uh, in fact, uh, Back here, you'll see the uh, the Quebec, the orange line there. How that how that big supply demand shift has taken place. So that it very much aligns with uh, with, uh, with with Morel's comments. Yes. Yeah, I would I would have a comment because I think that that's a very interesting point. But I do, I think also <clears throat> the political climate in Quebec has made that that uh, a lot of person have perceived that family medicine is undervalued. And there's probably something very specific in time and probably a message to other province about the importance of family medicine and, and make it a, a perceived uh, choice of carrier. Right. Thanks, Gil. Um, hi, Sylvia from Western. Uh, my question kind of combines this half with the previous half. Uh, you showed a graph showing the proportion of people who rank to, who match to certain specialties and you break it down by family, surgical, non-surgical. So my question has to do with the previous years unmatched. Uh, do those who go unmatched and come back in the second round, what's their profile like? Do they stay in the same specialty? Do they change specialties? Or like, and what specialties are they sort of coming from type of thing? So like, what's the profile of the s previous years unmatched coming back? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, I, I think, and I will answer it, uh, not with a lot of data, but uh, you know what I what I gather and the data we have looked at is folks do shift, and they shift oftentimes into a primary care discipline away from a specialty discipline. That's sort of the trend, uh, but it's a great question, and we'll actually bring some data for next year to really un un uh, un uh, unpackage that. Yeah, thanks. Hi, sorry, Roy Wyman, Family Medicine, Toronto. Just a quick question. I, I noticed some of your slides have a, a range going back to 2008. Some of them are 2013, some of them are 2014. Just sort of curious why there's that differentiation. That's a, that's a great question. Our, and, our, and our data experts uh, will tell you that uh, you know, some of the data we have is, is contained in, uh, in, in some different tables, and we sort of draw from that uh, other data, which has a, a bit more of a, uh, a complexity to it. Uh, we're, we're more comfortable with uh, what we have now, a data warehouse. And some of that data is in the data warehouse. And we haven't shifted all the data back into the 2008 period into the data warehouse. So as soon as we do, we'll be able to go back in time uh, with a bunch more confidence. Thanks. Hi, Andy again. Um, so just a quick follow-up on that question about prior year on grad. So you, uh, unmatched, sorry. You, so you said that they normally shift towards primary care. But the way that these prior year, I guess, grads are, are defined, um, do, they, do they capture the people who I guess didn't finish, uh, didn't go into second iteration, who just kind of dropped out of the match. Um, what about those people? Are they shifting to primary care or are they staying in the same kind of discipline that they were shooting for in the first time? I can't answer that question with any confidence. Uh, so, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, and Henry raised the issue of data and consistency and how do you understand what's this and what's that. Uh, it's that very kind of thing we need to get clear on first uh, before we actually explore further on down into the into some of that uh, underlying you know what where, where does the change happen okay. yeah thank you
Okay, we'll move on. Now we're into uh, unmatched and unfilled, so we're going to do a, uh, a deeper analysis and, uh, and sharing of some of the, uh, some of the different factors uh, and, uh, and outcomes of the unmatched and unfilled. So this is, uh, this is part of the data snapshot we shared in the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you'll see the percentage uh, of unmatched, and again, as defined by those who participated in second iteration but did not match, so 2.4% similar percentage to last year. Uh, and very similar number, 68 versus 69, and uh, the table at the bottom shows the absolute numbers. And then the burgundy line is what we felt this year needed to be uh, really uh, uh, you know, teased out uh, of the number. It has always been there, uh, but you had to, had, to, had to really kind of pull the number out of that very, one of the very first tables we talked about, which added up the number of people who participated in first iteration, and then compare that to the people who participated in second iteration. If there was a difference, uh, you know, what was going on there, and you were, had to imply that that was people who didn't participate in second iterations, and now we're calling it out. Uh, and uh, for one reason simply is that, you know, 46 is a big number. Uh, and uh, needed to have, uh, have further, uh, further assessment. So that number has gone up uh, to 1.6%, and now uh, 69 we call unmatched. Uh, 46 are those who did not participate in, uh, in second iteration. This is a breakdown of the 69 uh, who didn't match based on the categorization of their ranking status uh, in second iteration. So the blue, uh, at the bottom, uh, so for 2018, 58% of all of the people who didn't match in the second iteration were ranked by some programs, but each one of those programs who ranked them filled before their place on their rank order list. The 22% on the far, uh, on the upper quadrant on the right hand side were not ranked by any program. Now that could be, they could have applied to one program or 21 programs. Uh, so it, you can't really draw too much of a conclusion from that in terms of their qualification. Uh, it may have simply been a numbers game. Uh, if you applied to a discipline that only had one position across the country and, and 20 people applied to that, well, the program may not have ranked every one of those 20. You know, I don't, I don't know. So I just want to be cautious about the conclusions we draw from that. The 16% on the upper left-hand side uh, are those who were ranked by every program they applied to. And again, the program's filled before, uh, before their place in the rank order list. And then the green uh, around, around uh, 12 o'clock are those who could have matched uh, but didn't rank the program. And this year that was three. Uh, so that's been us. So every one of those categories have had some, uh, some uh, unmatched in second iteration uh, in, those, uh, in those categories. This is uh, a view of things over time uh, with, from each one of the current year cohorts. Uh, the blue line uh, is the percentage match rate in people's year of graduation. So when they were defined as current year graduates, that was the match rate uh, for that cohort. The burgundy is what the ultimate match rate is for that cohort over time, for all the subsequent matches that they have participated in. So in 2013, the current year uh, match rate was 97.6. Since then, uh, that cohort has continued to participate, some of them, and now that now 99.4% have matched. Uh, and then for 2013, there are four that are unmatched, and 11 are what are called unknown journey. And the reason they're called unmatched is because they have participated in the most recent match. 11, we don't know. They may be in the, in the U.S., they may, we don't, we don't know, so we don't want to, we don't want to presume anything, uh, but so that's how we categorize them. And as recent as 2017, so that's the, that's the cohort that uh, have, have also had a subsequent match here, the, the, the number is now 99.3%, so we had 68 current year unmatched in, uh, in 2017. Uh, and now, and that was 2.4%, and now we're at 99.3% uh, match rate again in the subsequent year. The, what has happened over time is that gap has increased. Uh, so where it was 1.8% between current year and, uh, and subsequent year, now it's, uh, it's 2.8. So there's a bit of a bigger gap. So there's, but the, the phenomenon still is people, people participate, they don't match, they come back in, something changes, whatever that is. Uh, and then, and then they match. Uh, so that's uh, that is the longer term, the longer term view. 
This is a, a, a very, a very uh, uh, populated uh, table, and, uh, but it, I think it, it shows a lot of good information. I'm sure you'll be able to uh, uh, do a deeper dive into it, but I'll, I'll go to the, sort of the bottom, the, the second page here. So there are five, five columns here, uh, all uh, broken down into, uh, into the first choice disciplines. And the first column are the people who matched in second iteration, and there were 83. CMGs matched in second iteration, and what their first choice discipline was in second iteration. The second column are the people who were not matched in second iteration, and what their first choice discipline was in second iteration. Third column are those who did not participate in second iteration, and what their first choice discipline was in first iteration. And just a couple things to, uh, uh, to just comment on here, that of the 46, of the 46 who did not participate, 39 uh, had first choice discipline in first iteration that had no positions in second iteration. So that's just one, one uh, piece of information. And then of the 83, 83 who matched, 33% of that group uh, ranked one discipline. And of the people who didn't match, 48% ranked one discipline. So that is a, another bit of a distinguisher, if you will, of those, uh, of those two cohorts. So you'll be able to unpack all this uh, in, uh, in, your, in your own uh, time. And then the 228 positions that were unfilled in first and 78 in, uh, in second. This is a breakdown of the, uh, uh, in the four, uh, the four, well, three groupings, because there were no surgical disciplines uh, positions available in second iteration. So this is a breakdown of, uh, of who filled which positions in, that, uh, in those three groupings. So current year CMGs, 51 uh, matched to uh, family medicine, 12 matched to internal medicine, and 20 matched to uh, to a non-surgical discipline, IMGs, you'll see 26 in the family medicine, two internal, 14 non-surgical, and so on. So that gives you a bit of a breakdown uh, in terms of those discipline groupings and the various applicant groups. This is a picture of uh, across the country, what the distribution is of the unmatched applicant, uh, CMG, and the, uh, and the unfilled positions. Uh, no big surprises there. The, 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 the predominant number of unfilled positions are in Quebec, as we, uh, as we uh, uh, saw before, uh, and then the distribution across the country uh, of the unmatched, 22 in Western Canada, 32 in Ontario, 12 in Quebec, and three in, uh, in the eastern part of the country. And this is just, again, uh, the, that final, final snapshot of where we, uh, where we started. Uh, 69 unmatched, we know 46 uh, CMGs did not participate in uh, second iteration, therefore they do not have residency position uh, as of July 1. It started with 3,308 3, 3, positions in the country uh, amongst the various streams, uh, 78 ultimately unfilled after second iteration. And then those are the themes. We talked about a lot of different things uh, over the last little bit. Uh, so these themes are just some of, the, some of what has emerged. Uh, there are lots of other things that uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll all take away and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have uh, found from the, uh, from the conversation. So um, hopefully that has been helpful for you. Uh, one final opportunity for some questions. And um, yeah. one of the sessions in the morning was regarding elective distributions and elective choices. And we see that students are applying to more electives and quote unquote pigeonholing themselves. And I'm not sure if you have this data, but I want to speak to about the 46 who opted not to go into it. This is a record number, much higher than last year. And when we looked at the ranking, more than half of them were in the surgical specialties. Mm -hmm. So my question is, do we know what the profile is as to why they didn't enter. Was it because they pigeonholed themselves and had literally no, nothing else to apply to because their application wasn't set up that way? Or is it potentially that they were hopeful that they apply again and get that specialty again? So I wasn't sure what the profile is for that. Yeah, so the, the, the profile around electives uh, is something that is, I think, worth, uh, worth looking at. Um, I, I, I can't, I think we're starting to speculate a little bit into what's in the, what's in the thinking, what's in the decision making of the individual applicant, which is pretty, which is a little tricky uh, for us. So we'll, uh, but we'll, we'll look to see if we can explore some data that might be able to, you know, put some, uh, put a bit of perspective on it. Yeah. Hi, 
John. It's Abby from uh, the MD program at the University of Alberta. In talking to some of our students this year, um, they've commented on like distributed and rural sites where previously they only had to apply one application to the university, and now they have to apply to every single site that they'd be interested. Yeah. Um, is this like a common theme that's happening across Canada, and is that you know partially for the increase in all the applications? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I, 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 from, from, the, from the conversations that I've had with people, a lot of that is to do with to support uh, applicant choice. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, there are multiple training sites has been the case for, you know, for some time. Uh, there, the decision to create a program out of a training site that somebody can apply to and rank, that, which gives them some choice as to what their preference is mm -hmm. when there are multiple training sites where they might apply to. So that's part of, part of I think, the answer to that question. I mean, and with, like with one like family medicine, you can apply to upwards of I think it's close to 90 English-speaking programs. Sure, sure. Which I think, which I think has some some of what's behind the 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 uh, the drop in in top three program choice mm -hmm. uh, uh, success rate in family medicine is because of that increased uh, increased choice. Yeah. Hi, uh, Rishi, first year medical student from McMaster University. Um, I just had a quick question about, so there's dedicated positions for CMG and IMG students within the first iteration, mm -hmm. but then in the second iteration that becomes blended. Yes. I was wondering if you had any data or any input on how much crossover there is with, b between those dedicated pools of students um, and how many spots that were originally dedicated to either CMGs or IMGs are then being taken um, by the students from those other pools. Um, and if you have any comments on that. Great, great question. But both things happen. Uh, you know, so CMGs will end up, with a, will end up in a position that originally was an IMG stream and the same thing goes the other way. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it really was a, we haven't done the, that slicing up of it yet, but it's a good, it's a good uh, question for a future one, uh, for sure. Okay. Yeah, but, but both things for sure happen. Okay, D uh, I just, like, I guess later on, is there a difference between that, that shift? Um, is one shifting more yeah. than the other? But I guess, like, when you do that data analysis, yeah, that would be great. Good, good question. Something, we'll, we'll, we'll take that away. Okay, yeah, thank great, you. Great question. Hi, um, my name is Christina Schweitz. I'm a medical student at the University of Calgary. Um, if you look at the number of unmatched surgical, unfilled surgical spots after the first iteration, there's one spot, and that spot continues to be unfilled after the second iteration. And we know that there were unmatched students who applied to surgical specialties who then applied to that spot in the second iteration. I'm wondering if you could maybe help us understand a little bit why a spot would go unfilled when there's obviously demand for it. Yeah, it's a Program choice. Uh, you know, programs have the uh, have the, the decision making as to uh, whether the folks who apply to those programs are are if they want to uh, include them in the rank order list. Uh, so that is the combination of things that happens. Uh, so uh, if, if there's quota available and, and an applicant applied there and ranked there, then it must mean mean that the program uh, didn't rank them. Uh, so that's uh, that is a program choice. Yeah. So last question, so I'm, I'm being my bosses uh, telling me to move on. <laughs> All right, thank you. My name is Sarah Smith. I'm a medical student from the University of Calgary. Um, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for all the detailed analysis you did on the unmatched graduates. I know that it's a huge topic of concern for us. Um, a lot of medical students are getting their information about the unmatched process from the news, and so I think that this is going to be really good to, to be accessed by medical students. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure if this is a good idea or not, but uh, if a student who went unmatched wanted to know what happened, that's the big question, what went wrong here? Mm -hmm. And I think that if I was not ranked by anyone and I went unmatched, or if I was ranked by some programs but I just didn't get high enough in the rank list, that information would mean something to me. Um, it would kind of dictate what I would do perhaps going forward. Is that information available to a student if they were to, uh, to contact you? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, and the reason is is that the program rank order list uh, is is also confidential uh, to the program. And as soon as you start telling uh, applicants uh, uh, about you know their their uh, whether they were or weren't ranked, uh, then you'll know uh, they'll know what program's uh, decision making was. And just like we wouldn't tell a program uh, if an applicant if they how many people ranked them and uh, and so on we just that's that's part of the policy of rank or list simply are not uh, are not shared 
Uh, there's been lots of conversation about what kind of feedback will be helpful to unmatched graduates. I think it's kind of along those lines. Uh, and we'd certainly be open to conversations about, about you know, what feedback would be helpful, you know, falling short of where it starts to compromise that, uh, the confidentiality of things. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, folks. Uh, over to Janice, who's going to take us into the, uh, the award conversation. Thanks, everybody.